What is up, everybody? Welcome to a very special episode of Limited Resources. Today, we're going to have an interview with the maestro. I'm, of course, Luis Scott Vargas, and here with the maestro himself, the clunky maestro, some might call him, Marshall Sutcliffe. Welcome to the show, Marshall. <laughs> Thanks, Luis. Uh, it's nice to be here. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> For those you don't know, uh, Marshall had no idea what's happening. I wrote the show, and uh, I figured it was his reward for... Uh, an impressive performance in the Lords of Limited versus Limited Resources showdown. Oh, this is my reward. Oh, I see. Oh, great, great. Okay. But but before we get to that, of course, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. We've got ChannelFireball.com. You can go to ChannelFireball.com for any cards, magic, flesh and blood, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, MetaZoo. It's a, it's a new marketplace, tons of ways to buy cards, tons of options. You can go to ChannelFireball.com. They've been a proud sponsor of this show for coming up on eight years now. Our, uh, one of our other sponsors is FTX. FTX is the platform where you can buy, sell, and trade digital objects and cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all sorts of things, NFTs. And uh, you can go to FTX.com or if you're in the US, FTX.us. Uh, as always, we'd like to remind you that these are a volatile form of investment. So make sure you're talking to an investment professional before making any big moves. The show is also brought to you by you, of course, the Patreon, <laughs> Limited Resources. You can go to the Patreon, uh, sign up, and uh, we will painstakingly sign a card and send it out to you for a- at any level of support. The, the cards aren't signed. <laughs> painstakingly mail out a card to you for many level of support. And, of course, the, the patrons are the lifeblood of the show, as uh, I'm told every week. All right. So, Maestro. That was great. You forgot to do the... <laughs> the the LR at checkout thing for CFB and you told people they'd get a signed card <laughs> when they don't. If you lived here, I would do signed cards, but sending like a thousand cards to you and back probably isn't great. In any case, uh, <laughs> let's kick things off with a little crack a pack here. I, I think like that's the, the first way to start from the, the, the clunky maestro himself. All right, we're going to start with the first card of Swamp. Obviously not going to take that. Then we've got Maestro's Theater. What do you think about that? Uh, that's actually a card I'm interested in. Um, you know, the Maestro's has been my uh, my second favorite, and and maybe even coming up on favorite because it feels like uh, Brokers has certainly taken the hit of being so popular, where it is much much harder to find those white two drops and such. So a card like this actually stands out to me early. Yeah, it's also nice and clunky. So you know, makes your makes your mana base just like I like it. <laughs> All right, uh, what about uh, Girder Goons? Girder Goons is is one of the highest rated black commons and has performed really well. Yeah, it, yeah. it would be on my list for it's sure. Outperformed Murder even strong it card. Has. Also pretty easily splashable. I've splashed it in blue white, for example, when you're like kind of semi obscura. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've also got Snooping Newsy, the blue black two drop. Wow, this is this is. This is a very uh, maestro centro centric pack, but these are all these are actually all cards that I would consider. Snoopy Newsy probably isn't a card I first picked, um, and probably wouldn't be looking to. But you know, I've I've talked about it before with maestros. Uh, the emphasis on two drops is really really strong. Like that is the thing that you need to shore up. The rest of the stuff is fine and kind of takes care of itself. But twos is really hard to get, and uh, Snoopy Newsy is one of them you can put in your deck. So yeah. Would you start on Burgoons or the theater over Newsies? Though? I would. I would. Yeah. All right. What about Run Out of Town? This is the 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 blue bounce spell that kind of bounces to the top of deck. It also hits any non land permanent. It does. I've used yeah. it against enchantments before. Me too. I have, and I've saved my stuff from it. You know, if if you find yourself in that spot where you're like, if I drew that card, I could win the game here. Then you know, you do that. Um, this is to me one of those cards that I kind of mentioned alongside when I, when I said that the rest kind of sorts itself out. These are the type of cards that you can pick up kind of whenever. And yeah, you can put one or two of them in your deck. They, they're playable. They're just not good and not something you need to prioritize here. I would be leaning towards the land or the two drop here probably. Yeah, I think the the brokers, low curve brokers does a lot better with running out of town than the clunky maestros. Yes. Uh, Mayhem Patrol, the one, two menace red two drop with uh, Blitz feel like other people play this more than I do. I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to play it more, but this doesn't really fill that role for me of the, of the important two drop. Not having, defensively. Yeah. Having one power on defense just isn't enough. Even if you have the backup plan of kind of cycling that later on. All right. Well, uh, you know, black mainstay common here, murder. Uh, but 
are are you at the point where you're going to take Gerder goons over murder? Um, no, I, I, I know that like it's performing better, but I feel like the first murders, uh, a little higher on my list than, uh, than Gerder goons, but whatever, I could probably flip a coin on them. All right. What about glamorous outlaw? This is the, the <laughs> maestro's, uh, six like drop every here. card has been maestro's so far. Like <laughs> it's, just, it's just been a weird pack. I don't know. Jeff. Generated yeah. Okay. It. This is starting to get a little suspicious. Um, that's one of my favorite cards in the set though. Um, but you're not taking it over like murder or murder goons. No, I'm not. But, um, but it, it's honestly on my list. Like I absolutely love that card. I think it's excellent. Um, it's exactly what you want for the late game. But one of the strengths of Maestros is that you can pick up cards like this later and you don't have to worry about how to finish the game. You know, we talked about like the crocodile or whatever once where it was like you, you needed a, a win con. But most of the time when you draft a deck like this, you end up um, getting this type of card later, mid to late pack, and it takes care of your late game for you. So, yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a little clunky, but but it's just, <laughs> it is a little clunky. What about a uh, Echo Inspector? This is the three and a blue, two three. Wood. <laughs> what the hell? That's another blue card in this pack. Come on, are there no green cards in this thing? Well, we just probably haven't got to him yet. <laughs> okay, yeah, I love Echo Inspector, but again, it falls into the category like anything that costs four mana that isn't like a bomb or whatever. There are a lot of three and four drops in this. Set. Exactly is is not a priority. Like you're going to pick up things like Girder Goons, which is often a four. Um, Echo Inspector run out of town. Like this stuff just sort of sorts itself out. It's not the type of stuff you need to prioritize. I wouldn't prioritize it here. Don't All tell right. me uh, red card next. No, no. No. Uh, Maestro's Initiate. This is a free one. <laughs> that a black card, right? You can exile from your graveyard to uh, draw two cards and discard a card. This is one of those cards that, uh, and, and I'm, I'm figured out what's going on here, by the way, Louis. <laughs> this is not a normal pack, um, but I kind of like it. Um, the, the Initiates, you know, might be on the list for a type of card that we get to on the Sunset Show, which is next week, right? We're doing... We're going to sunset yeah, this. Right. <laughs> We're over it. Uh, but the sunset show where we, um, where I say like, I can read this card and think that it's quite good, but then in practice, it's just like maybe borderline playable at best. Like it just never really quite does the thing. Turns out, you know, spending five mana kind of at any point in the game to really just not affect the board is a big cost. All right. Well, what about Witty Roastmaster? I can't imagine you're a huge fan of this. No. The three, two, that that pings when you play a creature. Don't I don't play this card yet. I don't like it. All right. Well, we're on to the uncommons. We've got a corpse <laughs> appraiser. So this is the <laughs> three three that eats something out of the graveyard to get you a strategic planning. Well, yeah. How fortunate. Um, <clears throat> that would be my pick here. Um, I don't mind committing to a good uh, shard or family or whatever they're called now. Um, and and this is the type of card that is the bread and butter for this deck. <clears throat> it's the type of card that allows you to add to the board in a pretty decent defensive way while also furthering your other game plans in this, in this time, it's card advantage. All right. Uh, so you're on corpse appraiser over murder. You yeah, think I am. What about tainted indulgence? This is the blue black instant draw two cards, <laughs> then discard a card. If you don't have five types, <laughs> uh, th this is uh, a, another card. I actually really like a lot, but never prioritize because finding card advantage usually isn't the issue though. If you are in the market for it, this is probably the the better version of it. But yeah, I would take the corpse appraiser. Right, Let's this, just say is, the the price on corpses is high right now. Well, I mean, we'll see how high because the last one comes actually Maestro's Charm. Oh, so look at that! Same <laughs> casting cost as corpse appraiser, but doesn't give you the two for one opportunity. No, and that's why I would take the appraiser over it. I I do like a Maestro's Charm. I'll play it. A little bit of flexibility. A little bit of. Um, I've been to the game with this before. Yeah, I have too. In fact, I I had a a deck that had two or three of them, and I just went end step. And then my turns for the full, you know, drain six. Um, and that is really nice. That also can screw up alpha attacks and do a lot of stuff. And then, of course, primary mode is just to hit something for five. But um, ultimately, it's a one for one. And uh, if I have the chance to get a legitimate two for one, like a really good two for one, like Corpse Praiser, I'm going to stick with that. All right. Well, we've got a mythic rare here. What could we have it be? Lord Xander, the collector. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> the four red, black, Xander. blue, six, six. Uh, they discard half their cards in their hand, rather right down when it enters the battlefield. When it attacks, you mill them for half their library. And when it dies, they sack half the lawn land permanents they control also. Right yeah. Down. You know, week one, I would have taken Lord Xander here. Um, 
But after having played with it a little bit, I've, I've been lucky. I think I got it once or something. I played against it a couple of times. It was powerful. <clears throat> it wasn't bad, but I, I would actually take Corpse Appraiser over it. It just it doesn't do quite enough. Like I, it might just be that everything's rounded down. I don't know, but it just still feels a little bit too much like a big dumb six drop, you know, it's just, or seven drop. Yeah. And it's like, I, I've, you know what I mean? I don't know. Where you trade off two creatures for it when they attack, but then you don't have to sack anything because you traded two of your three permanents yeah. off. Getting milled even twice by this isn't that bad. Like, and once to basically is an advantage most of the time. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um, also, pretty good chance that you'll wheel uh, a Maestro's card out of this pack, <laughs> I, was I think. I say, so. I feel good about getting something back here. <laughs> That's quite a pack. <laughs> All right. So let, I let's like start that with, pack. The, with the Lunar Resources versus Lords Limited showdown. So that that was last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was the ninth showdown. We've 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 done uh, we've done a lot of these, by the way. It's becoming an institution. I really love it. I mm-hmm. I've got to thank uh, BK for always be willing to play with us, and then of course uh, Ethan, Ben, and Alex for for being the opposition. Uh, we are currently well walking into the showdown. We were five and three. Mm-hmm. Uh, I made some predictions that ended up not being entirely accurate. They were and, very uh, close, though. <laughs> And uh, at the end of the showdown, you know, we 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 ended up with a narrow five to four victory, uh, thanks to you three owing with, in fact, clunky maestros. And uh, whereas BK and I both had streamlined like basically two color aggro decks, his is literally two colors blue white, mine was red green splash two black cards or something. Yeah. It, and uh, <laughs> and we both went one two. You went three zero, defeating uh, every member of the opposing team yeah. in, uh, in 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 some pretty epic battles. So. Uh, First, like walk us through your draft. How did, how did this draft start? Yeah, so it, it started. So first off, you made that prediction and I really didn't want it to be true. Now, I wasn't going to like change my picks based on it. Uh, if the cards were there, they were there. But I was like, it was definitely in the back of my head. And I was talking about it on my stream and stuff. And I opened up a pack and it had, um, I, I think, a, a, a medium a triple gold card, you know, maybe something from Riveteers or Obscure or something like that. I can't remember. But then it also had the, um, what is it called? The, not Brawler, Bruiser, Brawler. What is it? The, the one that gives minus one, minus one to everything on the other team. Night Clubber. Night Clubber. Thank you. Clubber. That's what I'm thinking of. And I actually really like that card in the format. It, it cleans up a decent amount of stuff and you can get your card back out of it. And it's not hard to get some value from it. And it's also single color, which in a tiebreaker or something close, um, you know, will make me want to go. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to take the night clubber. And it's really tough because when you first pick a night clubber, it's not like you're thinking like, I'm going to be riveteers, right? You're not, you're not like, all right, let's do this riveteers. You know, I'm like thinking, oh God, like Luis could be right. Right. Like I, this is a first step towards a very <laughs> clunky maestro stack. And then I the mean, next, it, pa- at that point, you're not going to be riveteers because the riveteers suck. Exactly. And you could be maestros or obscura. But we all know that's like an 80-20 split. Exactly. And and I'm just, and it's like, it's tough because obscure is fine, but it's really, you know, it's on the lower end of the spectrum, right? It's not where you want to be. And, um, you know, I think that Maestro's is just better than it. It's like, they're similar in build, but Maestro's just has access to better stuff. And I'm more comfortable with the Maestro's builds and cards and prioritizations and stuff too. So I have to factor that in when we're sitting down like this and I'm like, oh God. And then the the other thing mm -hmm. is if you start with a black card, Maestro's is just straight up more likely to be where you end up than Obscura because there's two allied color pairs, black, red, and blue, black. Whereas Obscura, there's only blue, blacks and black, white's not a supported color pair. So you're just straight up more likely to be Maestro's by taking a black card anyway. Of course, the clunky Maestro himself is, is you know, yeah. knew what was going to happen. I, yeah. The prediction was random. Yeah, and also it was a double black card, right? I'm taking a one BB. Kind like of. this is, I'm, yeah, oftentimes it doesn't get cast for that. But <clears throat> at any rate, uh, so I, so I'm, I'm drafting my seat, you know, I'm open still, right? Took the best card and it could go any direction. And then of course, you know, five picks in, I, I have just the full clunky maestros build and I'm just going like this in <laughs> my hand on my face and the chat's just laughing at me because they're like, Luis was right, you know, and then- yeah, I- at what point mm-hmm. did you realize you were a lock to draft Clunky Maestros? Was it about five picks in? Kind of, yeah. I was like, "This is ha- like th- this is what's open. This is what I'm picking. Like these are the like." And there was no. It wasn't like I was like, "Oh man, it was so close. I could have been white blue or so." It wasn't even close. It was just like, <laughs> "Yeah, these are the cards." And then just to go 
for the full clunk, right? Like, because it wouldn't have been enough for me to just draft maestros and have you be like, ha ha, it's maestros. Like it was actually super clunky because it's still team draft. It's still hard to get the stuff that you really want. And the two kind of, <laughs> the two kind of peaks of the clunk were one of them is I had, I think three copies of the Backstreet Boys, right? Yeah, which, I but I was, sure. yeah, which I was primary um, black red though. So they were not, you know, I, I had fixing and stuff, but it was like, you know, I mean, it felt like, like I was splashing outlaw, for them. So yeah. You can play a turn three Backstreet Boy is <laughs> yeah, not really where you want to be. <laughs> and I had that and they were kind of core to the game plan of not dying early and, and filling that two drop slot. And then also, I opened up the Riveteer's Dragon, right? The one that lets you sacrifice stuff and throw it around. Zeatora, the incinerator. Yeah, what is it called? Zeatora, the incinerator. Zeatora, yeah. And that came, I think, in pack two or pack three. It was after I was kind of decided. And, you know, I just decided it, it, was, it wasn't worth the risk of passing it um, just in case I, I hooked somebody they up. They played it, too. They played they, – Alex had a five color deck and Ben and Ethan both had three color decks. So. Yeah. And so I said, well, I'll just take it. But, you know, I was like keeping my eye open for some try lands that maybe because it's only one color off. It's just a little bit of green for me to get that card in. And, and it's really powerful. And, you know, if you're going to go clunky, let's go really clunky. And and so that's what I ended up doing. Um, but it did pay off. The card was really good. Um, it, it led to some some wins that I, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, with. Uh, you know, another random six drop in my colors or whatever. So, yeah. What did you think when you were finished drafting? How did you, you know, but but when you looked at like the, the card pool you had to build from? I didn't feel very good, but I usually don't in team draft. Like, you know, I I, I think uh, just as primarily, a, a, you know, uh, on, you know, a regular draft drafter, when you look at a team draft deck, it's, it's worse, right? And so I'm going like, ugh, this is really clunky. And like, you know, I felt like I kind of scrapped together with my mana, but again, not enough to be like just full on triple color, you know, feel real comfortable about it. <laughs> yeah. And then I also splashed as well. And then I, sh and then, you know, we had our little powwow after where it's like me, you and uh, BK on discord, where we talk about our decks and stuff like that. And I said, and I asked you what you thought, and you were like trying to take out the the Backstreet Boys, and that was you know correct uh, to think of. And I'm just going like, yeah, this is tough because you know th those really did fill out a lot of my my two drops. We ended up trimming one of them, but we did run them. I mean, it was I mean, you, and they weren't attacking like ever. You basically splashed blue for <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a kind of mediocre two drop. So it it was clunky maestros all the way down. It really but was. Then, but then you you pulled out the 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 win. You carried the whole team. You went three zero. Yeah. Your, your deadweight teammates got one win each. How did, how did it feel at the end there? Especially when you kind of knew you were going to win against Ethan. Yeah, it was interesting because um, it was a, it was like actually very stressful. <laughs> so the first match I won, but you also predicted that I would go one and two with my clunky maestro deck, <laughs> and I'm like. Okay, so now, like, not only have I charged headfirst into the deck that he predicted, and now I've picked up the one win that he said I would. So in the second round, I actually felt a lot more pressure just to be like, no, Luis can't have called this perfectly, even though it actually felt pretty comfortable from a game situation wise, because as it turned out, you, BK and I all won our first round. And, you know, for those of you that haven't played a lot of team draft, you know, you're playing a total of nine matches. So it's the first team to get to five, you know, so now we're playing six more matches. And between all of those, we just need to get two more. Like, you know, Luis needs to win one. I need to win one. That's it. That of six, right? BK needs to go two and oh, and we win the thing. So I'm feeling, you know, we're a heavy, heavy favorite after we oh, sweep yeah. round one. And I'm, so I'm thinking like, okay, the pressure on that's off. We're like, we're in a really good position to win this thing. I need to worry about not making Luis look smart here. <laughs> I need to pick up this win. <laughs> and then I did, and it was really close. And, you know, one of those like, game three, sweat them out type things. And then I go to the chat and it's like, Luis lost, BK lost. It's like, okay, well that happens, whatever. You know, now, now we're sitting on four. We just need one out of the, the last of us to win. And then as we go, I mean, BK's tilting off in our chat because he has these obs obscene situations where he has like five white cards in hand with all islands or whatever. And the match before he had the exact opposite, just all yeah, planes. It was, crazy. He, <laughs> it was he, insane. He's got mana screwed every game and is just nine, eight. Yeah. <laughs> it was incredible. Anyway. And so he loses and 
uh, as I'm going into game three in the last round against my nemesis, Lord Tupperware, um, you know, I'm getting reports that Luis is also heading to game three. And I'm like, oh, God, like now now it's like, whoa, like, you know, any one it's game. Insane. You yeah, know, we, we could lose. This we could definitely lose this. And then and then my chat saying, OK, it's not looking good for Luis. Like he's probably going to end up losing this, you know, and I'm like trying to fight out you know, this game. And eventually I ended up um, getting the dragon down, had an interesting position as well, where um, I had a, a, a I had a good attack with it. But Ethan had shown me and somewhat represented the make make something a four four flying angel in a talent of turn and he already had a two two flyer and he had like a random treasure or something on the battlefield because that thing also yeah, animates had, artifacts uh, the ominous parcel yeah that's what it was he had an ominous parcel and so like i if he tapped down his mana i could theoretically attack into it but if he had three he could wake up the parcel and double block the dragon and i thought about like well would i be okay with that and i thought no like i really wouldn't this thing just sits here and like wreaks havoc on the board um but i didn't have much to sacrifice to it at the time at the time i had two um body droppers and so I could sack one to it and then I'd get a counter on the other, but it wouldn't actually kill anything as it stood on the board with the two. And so I didn't want to just start throwing away board position. Definitely felt the pressure to start attacking with the dragon, but decided against it. Um, he clearly didn't have an answer for it now. Uh, and, you know, you need some pretty specific stuff to kill a six toughness creature. So I decided to sit on it and wait till I drew a few more creatures um, to start throwing them around. And then I did and, and, and eventually um, got the job done there. So... I remember watching the end of that, and it was a big sweat because you had Zeotora and the two body droppers in play. Mm -hmm. You had Demons Do as the last card in your hand, the like pay two life, draw, scry two, draw two. Yes. And he and he casts dig up the the, the grave, or dig up the body, and gets a corrupt court official back. Yes. But then he like taps out to play something else instead. That was a huge sweat. And it was just like, oh, yeah. Because then you got to cast your draw two, and then the game just get completely out of control for him because once you fuel up Zeotora, like the game just ends really quickly. Right. And I actually, I'm glad you remember that spot because I felt that that was a close judgment call itself because the, the way that that turn actually ended is I did have one mana available. And so I could sack body drop or just do random two to, to Ethan, which wouldn't really do anything, but you also get three treasure off of Zeotora. And I could have cast demons do that turn as well. I decided to maintain my board state and then just be patient and cast it the next turn because I had plenty of mana and felt that I didn't need to, to sacrifice my board state now. But then when all of a sudden Ethan brought back the corrupt court official, I'm going, oh no, this is disaster. Like that card, you know, Demons Do is, I mean, that's probably the best card to have in my hand at that time. And if he takes it away from me, like I'm just stone cold top decking and just have to start ripping creatures. Like this could get ugly. What would be your approach to that? Like, would you just go for it and sack that board presence to get the thing done? Or would you wait? No, I, I liked waiting. I, don't, I would not have sacked. The thing is, body droppers are also so strong. If you draw any other creature, they both become three threes too. I know. When you sack a Zeotora. So like. I know. And then I Zeotora can sack them. a discard spell okay. back. Okay. You know, I think yeah. that's unreasonable. Because it was so, an interesting um, discussion in chat. But yeah. So we, we ended up uh, prevailing. Actually, so we're up six three in the showdowns. In terms of matches, we're up 41 to 40. It's incredible. Yeah. So I guess, I guess you know, that just d determines w which team's clutch is, is really what it comes down to. <laughs> <laughs> Our clutch rating is very, very high. Very, yeah. very high. I mean, this could so easily just be swung. Like, it could so easily just be 6-3 for them. Like, yeah. It just wouldn't totally. take much. Um, yeah. But it's not. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to talk a little to, to, to kind of take a step back a little bit more generally about drafting uh, maestros in Streets of New Capenna here, since mm -hmm. that's one of the strategies you seem to like. And, and it seems like you even liked it more now because Brokers has actually gotten kind of overdrafted. Yeah, I do. I've been leaning on it more. It just feels like it's the naturally open thing, right? A lot of times, as you mentioned, it, it's a blue black base type situation. And <clears throat> a lot of because red is the worst color of those three. It is the least important. It is the one you don't want to start on. But if you can splash around for a few key red cards, they can really pull their weight. You know, a card like Strangle goes a really long way, for example, where you don't need untapped red on turn one. Like that's not what Strangle's for. It's for turn three when you kill 
you know, their, their three drop or their two drop, or it's for the turn when you can cast a spell and then also cast strangle in that turn and remove a meaningful threat from the other side of the battlefield. And so cards like that, and then of course, you know, cards like Corpse Appraiser and stuff like that, that are red, um, are the way to go. But, you know, if you're kind of centering in black, look, if I could just pick the colors from this set, black wouldn't be my number one. It would be white. But of the open colors, <laughs> of the colors you can actually get, black black actually is kind of where I want to be. And then a bunch of it is somewhat geared towards green and white, um, you know, cards, like where you can get some extra edge um, with like the Night Clubber and, and Whack and stuff like that. So, so the kind of the advantages you see is that like, you get a strong base, a strong control game, and it's a little underdrafted right now. And it's a little underdrafted, right? That, that's the thing to me that pushes it towards being um, more more uh, appealing, right? Is is the fact that it's like not being scrapped out over, you know, I've had a few where I started with actually a pretty strong broker start, you know, um, two two double strike shield guy, you know, that kind of stuff where I'm like, all right, I'm in business, and it's been ludicrously overdrafted, right? Like where I would have picked yeah. actually any two mana creature that costs the, in green or, or white, and there were none. And it's like, people pick up on this stuff. Like they know, and you know, you might think, well, not everybody listens to all the podcasts. That's true. But how many people per draft pod do you need that listen to LR Lords limited or that are 17 lands users? You only need one or two, maybe three at the most to, to or really just- skew that people who draft a lot and notice they win more with brokers. Like they don't totally. necessarily like I came to that conclusion without, I mean, obviously like I'm, I'm on LR, but I don't, I, I, without listening to anyone or looking at 17 lands, a couple drafts in, I'm like, Oh, brokers is where it's at. That's just, yes. like, I've got seven ends with brokers three times in my first eight drafts or whatever. This looks like it's pretty strong. And then of course you could also just read angelic overseer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or inspiring overseer rather. Inspiring but, um, overseer, yeah. So so what what are some of the top commons or notable uncommons when when you're looking to get into maestros? So the the thing I mentioned before when we did our um farcical crack a pack there was the two drops are super, super important. And it's a little weird because the two drops aren't actually that powerful. You know, like Corrupt Court Official is a fine magic card, but, you know, that that isn't some bomb in the format or something like that. Snoopy Newsy, it's an okay card, but it's not amazing. Um, nevertheless, you have to prioritize cards like that because if you don't, you'll end up with a slow deck. You'll end up with a lot of threes and fours and then some fives and sixes um, to kind of round it out, but not that many ones. There's not that many ones that are playable in the deck. You know, Expendable Lackey is okay, but it's not great. And, uh, and the other ones kind of stink. And then, you know, outside of spells like, like strangle or whatever, but, and then the twos, you know, you have a few more playables, but they're not really there. So it is strange, but you do have to prioritize cost over power level sometimes. So that's an issue. Um, where are you at on, uh, make disappear? Um, that's the counter spell. Yeah. The mana leak for two. Yeah. I'm, I'm up on it now. Um, ever since we had that discussion on the podcast, I started taking it higher, you know, after seeing it again, you know, you and I both kind of wanted to form our own opinions on stuff and then talked about it with each other and then, and looked at 17 lands data and your take and 17 lands take was both that make disappear was better than I had it. Right. I didn't have it unplayable, but I had it like fringe and usually doesn't make the cut. And I started playing one or two most of the time, totally fine you do run into the awkwardness of getting your mana set up where it is not uncommon for you to want to play two tap lands in a row or play a tap land on turn two, but whatever, it's worth it to, to move your curve around to have something relevant to do on two. And the fact that it could keep their two drop or three drop off the battlefield is massive. It's so much better than any of the other two drops, right? Like you would much rather counter their two or three drop than play a Snoopy Newsy because it often can't keep up. So I'm definitely higher on that card. I think it's excellent. <clears throat> I think that there's a ton of one for ones in this in this uh, color trio. So even though murder's nice and efficient and good to have, it's a little bit difficult to cast, and it is ultimately a one for one. Maestro's Charm is similar to that. Run out of town is similar, where it's just like those aren't the the critical things. You will get some number of those, and you do need them. I mean that you know. The most successful Maestro's decks that I've had, strangely enough, have been the most simple in execution in that they were um, good early defense. You know, we call it defensive speed here. Those decks, my de- my decks that did well had good defensive speed and a lot of flexible one-for-ones and then card draw. 
Like you just reload on those things and even the Bant decks can't keep up with that. The where you run into trouble is things like shield counters are a problem, right? Because if you're trying to one for one with those two, then you're you're in trouble. That's not good. And then flyers can be an issue because it can be hard to overwhelm. Like it can be hard to draw enough removal to kill all their flyers. I've died to a lot of obscure initiate because it's the last thing standing. The card itself doesn't really matter. It's not a quick clock. The lifelink isn't really relevant in the matchup, but like I'll kill all the other things and then they're just like, here I am, you know, and and they're just pecking away for two every turn. So that type of stuff matters a lot. Um, So again, big picture, of course you need these, these one for one removal spells, but they're actually not the priority. The priority are good gold cards and cheap, you know, one or two mana spells that actually matter. That's, that's where, those are the things that like I feel relieved when I pick up even just something like a corrupt court official, I'm like, okay, okay, we're okay. Cause <laughs> you can get to the end and not have those things. Like that does happen where you never ever get to the end and go, wow, I'm short on four drops again. Like I'm short on I, card draw. There's so much card draw in this color trio. You know, we talked about it in the cracker pack where you've got a four mana blue card draw spell, a four mana black card draw spell, corpse appraiser and Tain and indulgence. Like just those right there are already way too much. There's also things like the rare, you know, the witness tampering or whatever it's called, you know, drawing extra card uh, enchantment. There's tons of stuff like that too. So getting cards is not hard. And then the last thing is probably my favorite common in the set is the outlaw. Um, it's so perfect for this deck. It is what makes the deck work because, yeah, you get the mana fixing, but it's just the best six drop to cast uh, relative to its deck. Um, at six, it's perfect. It's exactly when you have enough mana, you often hit your land drops, and it really does a great job of stabilizing the board and then finding you the answers you need to to continue into the late game. So, so how do you get into Maestros? I mean, if, if you're not the clunky Maestro himself, where <laughs> where you just uh, you you just you, you start you start out with that as your lens, but how how, how do you? At what point are you like, ah, oh, I, I now I've now I figured out that this is where I'm at. Usually it starts like for me either with uh, a really powerful gold card, right? Like a corpse connoisseur or excuse me, corpse appraiser or something like that. <clears throat> that, you know, again, I'm not afraid in this format to take one of those triple colored cards and just be like, let's give this a shot. I don't force it from there, but like, you know, it's interesting because you can have one of your colors like mostly cut and still come up with a total deck. So it is often the case that you can kind of just push it through. So that starts it off a lot of the time. Or if I feel, of course, if there's a bomb or something in those colors, that'll start you off. But usually it's because there isn't something better that I want to go for. Like if I open a good broker's card, I'll probably just take it and take a shot because it's not like you need to be the only broker's drafter at the table. You just need there to not be four, right? You, you, you need to be the second or third one and you can still put together a deck and, uh, in, and have a good shot, especially if you understand how to prioritize like the cost and which cards are better for that particular deck. So if I'm going into Maestros, it's because there wasn't one of those um, in in Brokers. And uh, and yeah, and it usually ends up being one of the gold cards or something like that that entices me. Could be a murder, but... What do you think uh, some of the keys are to having a successful Maestros deck? Is it synergy, raw power? You know, you've mentioned having a good low curve. It's having... Um, it, it's like making a... a rec- it's like a recipe, Right. Synergy is not the name of the game at all. Like, in fact, this deck is one of the lowest on Synergy that I've played in modern limited formats in a while. Yeah, there are some payoffs for it, like filling up your graveyard with, you know, different mana cost things and stuff like that. But I never, ever pick cards going, oh, hey, I can get the five, the fifth type in my yard by doing this. That That is not what this is about. The other, you know, main thing would be the sacrifice sub theme. Nope, that's not what this is about either. Again, these little benefits pop up here and there, but you never draft towards them. This is about getting all the pieces together. Do you have enough ones and twos? That's, that's your first checkbox. Do you have enough card draw spells, but not too many? Remember, if you have too many, you're gonna get ran over, right? So there you go. You need to make sure you have, say, between two to three spells that draw you cards somehow. Do you have enough removal? This is a removal-based deck. This is a deck that has access to easily the best removal suite in the in the format, and it covers all of your bases. You can do uh, everything from strangle for cheap stuff up to, you know, minus three, minus three end of turn for stuff with shield counters on it, up to murder to kill most anything. 
And you get good versions of all of these cards as well. So you need enough of those. But again, excuse me, not too many, right? If you end up with nine removal spells, like that is not where you want to be. You do need blockers, things that can affect the board and that can act as removal spells turn after turn. So, and then you need finishers, right? And the finishers hopefully are the outlaw. Like that is the thing that really sort of, uh, you know, rounds out this recipe um, because it does provide two critical things and the rest is whatever. It's just the cards that you get that are on color. Hopefully you get some good gold cards in there. You know, um, some of the really powerful stuff like Corpse Praiser, you know, can get you there, but it is weird. It is not synergy based. It's just fundamental limited control deck stuff where like you want defensive speed, you want removal, you want card draw and you want finishers. And whenever I've had a good balance of those, I felt like my deck had a really good shot to put up six or seven wins. What do you think are some uh, underrated cards in the family? Since, uh, you know, you, you've talked a lot about costs, but are, are there certain cards you like a little bit more than the public you think? Probably. I mean, I probably like murder a little bit more. <laughs> which is a little bit of a weird yeah, the one. Yeah, stock is somehow dropping on that one. <clears throat> yeah, it is. And and I get it. Again, it's replaceable and it's a little difficult to cast. So, I do understand, you know, w- why people would think that, but um but I I'm still fairly high on it. Um I like back I like Backstreet Bruiser. I really do think that it's a, a a it really does solve a lot of the problems specifically against brokers, right? Like it does really well against the shield creatures, including even the double striker, where at least you get the shield counter off with it, where none of your other twos do. (laughs) Right. None of your, like you pointed that out in the other show, none of the other twos actually do it. Um, Make disappear is definitely, you know, rising on my list or whatever. Um, I do like run out of town as a, as a one of Um, witness protection has been fine for me. Look, it's kind of a do what you got to do thing but it actually does do work um, a little bit more than you'd think. Anything that costs two and is playable, like Corrupt Court Official or whatever, is way, way higher um, than you'd normally think. Um, One card that the public doesn't seem super high on, but I often end up running one of is Midnight Assassin. That's two and a black one, two flying death touch. Look, it's not where you want to be, right? I'm not going to tell you it's a good card, but it does solve some really annoying problems in the sky, and I, I will run it. I I absolutely will Low have that murder. card. What's that? <laughs> Slow motion murder. <laughs> Slow motion murder. Yeah, it's murder at home or whatever they say. Yeah, and uh, and and I and I have uh, had some at least decent um, you know results with that card. I, I don't go crazy with it like the second one. You definitely don't want that type of thing. But but you can run it. You know, it it, it is not as bad um, as it might look to you. And then. Yeah. Otherwise that's probably it. Like for, for the ones that I, I tend to play maybe a little bit more, um, you know, than most. And so lastly, are you usually like three even colors or are you biased towards blue black is what it sounds like. Yeah. I'm biased towards blue black. That's right. And then the red fills in with gold cards and strangle and then any type of bombs or anything like that. Um, if the card's a little bit more expensive, I'm willing to play it like another one that could fall into the the underrated category by a little bit is Wrecking Crew, four and a red, four or five reach trample. You know, when you're looking to stabilize the board, even if red's your tertiary color, you can still get Wrecking Crew down by turn five. It's not that big of a problem. And it does. It just does. Like if you play that card and it sticks, it's very difficult to attack into. There's not many creatures that are bigger than it than it on the ground. And there's basically no like non-rare flyers that are bigger than it in the air. So, you know, it, it looks like an aggressive card. I mean, the guy's, I guess he's coming in like a wrecking ball. He's got, he's like swinging one behind his arm, his head or whatever, he's reach, though. but he's got reach. It is a defensive card when you want it to be. And, uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll I have no shame, man. I'll play or I'll play one of those guys too. All right. So that, that, that concludes that portion. We're going to move on to our next segment of the show, meeting the maestro. So everyone asks. <laughs> how are the maestros in draft? But no one asks how the maestro is. <laughs> I'm going to take a journey here into the, to the mind of the maestro. I like this. Marshall Sutcliffe. So maestro, you've talked a little bit about your, you know, life before LR and like some of the things you've done, but I, I want to really drill down a little bit more. Mm-hmm. What, what, what do you think led you down the path you're on? And like, would you have predicted that when you were 18? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, no way. Zero chance. Yeah. Um, no, it's funny. I I've, 
I've talked to you about this before, Luis. I guess it's kind of personal, but it's it's interesting just uh, how you're raised and how what the expectations are on you and how that kind of, I think, changes your outlook on life or whatever. And the way I was raised, my parents didn't put high expectations on me. I don't mean that as something terrible. They kind of let me do my thing. They kind of were like, not really the type of parents to get in there and be like, you need to do this, or these are the grades you have to get, or you have to go to this school or do get this job. They never were really like that. They kind of were trying to prioritize Um, like being a good person, like that, that was what my mom would tell me. Like, I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me what you choose to do for work. It's just like, as long as you're a good person was kind of what she would say. And so, you know, I assume she didn't know about podcasts when when saying all that. (laughs) No, no. When I was 18, she did not. But, you know, I, and I mean, I ended up, you know, I I didn't really have high, (laughs) it took me a while to kind of find my lane, right? Like when I finally quit working, um, kind of my, my real job air quotes at AT and T I was 34. Like, you know, that, that took me a long time. And, and I worked at the grocery store till I was like 26 or 25 or something. You know, I worked there from right out of high school for, you know, six, seven years. Like I was there for a long time. And I just remember, you know, it was interesting because I liked that job. Like I didn't have any, like I, I worked at the check stand and then I ended up driving like one of those trucks for a while and stuff. And I was like, fine with it. It was just, it was my job. And that was that. And, but you know, like, I don't know, you know, my family was more of the type to like, it was a union job and they were like, Hey, you're in a, you got a union job. Like you're set, you know, you're good. You know, you did it whatever. Um, and you know, but, but then I got really lucky and I got a job at AT AT&T, a close friend of mine, Daniel, he had worked there and he basically got me an interview. You know, he just said, look, like I can, I I can get it, even though you're not really qualified for the job in a traditional way. He's like, I know you could do it, but you know, I can get you an interview, but you kind of have to take it from there. And so, you know, I had no idea how any of that stuff worked and, and, you know, he kind of gave me some pointers and stuff and I went in and interviewed for it. And they gave me the job and they're like, yeah, we're going to give you a shot or whatever. And they hired me as a contractor, like, it, you know, whatever. That's how they, a lot of companies do that. But I really was like, hey, this is my shot, right? Like I can, I can not work at the grocery store here and get like a, 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 a better job. And uh, I remember being really intimidated by it, you know, um, going in because like I finished two years of college, like I have a, a two year degree basically, but I couldn't afford to keep going to college after that. Um, I just, you know, I paid for it myself going to the college that I did go to. And I just didn't really have an infrastructure around me to say like, here's how you do this. Like you go to college and you get an internship, then you get a job or you start interviewing, or if you get this degree, then you'll go to that. And so when it came to the end of it, I was like, well, I can't afford to to transfer to university, um, on my salary or on my hourly pay for the, from the grocery store. And so I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I just didn't go. I was like, I guess I'm just not going to do that. And so I, uh, I just kept working at the store and, you know, so when I walked into the job at 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 and T, you know, everybody there had a a bachelor's degree or something, you know, just like normal people, um, that went to college or whatever. This wasn't some, you know, it was, we were working on the website, right. It wasn't some like think tank or something, but these were all, you know, people that had had that. And I remember thinking like, I felt intimidated by that you know, like that, that I didn't have that. And, and it was, you know, and I was still in my, uh, twenties there. And, you know, that was something that like was still very much in my head. And, you know, I had been told by teachers and counselors, Oh, you got to go to college. You got to go to college. You got to, and that's why I went, I, I didn't really know why, like, I didn't have like a goal for it. I just was told my whole life, you got to go, you're supposed to go. Um, but then when, you know, I found out that it was going to be, you know, however much money I was like, well, I, I just can't do that. And I stopped and it was still in my head though, that like, I should be finished. I, I didn't finish it. I haven't finished this yet. And when I went into the job at at and I remember thinking like, I'm just, I'm not going to be as smart as these, as these people. I'm not gonna be able to keep up. And I was really nervous about it. And then I got in there and I was like, I'm going to apply myself, right? Like I bought a book and I, and I did online you stuff. You were and doing QA, right? I was doing QA work. That's right. That's like testing the website. And basically like, I won't bore you cause it was boring, but basically uh, what I was doing for most of the time I was there was, you know, when you go to a website, there's tracking that happens. It tracks how you interact with the site, what you click on, how long you're on a page for, where you navigate, that type of thing. And when you gather data on a big website like AT&T, which was, it was a 
the top 10 biggest website in the world at the time. It was a massive website. Um, you can see some really particular trends and when you, and then you can pass those trends on to the marketing and design people and they can say, okay, well, we're losing a lot of people on this page. Why? Let's try to tweak it. And they would change the layout or change the wording or change the buttons or do whatever to try to see if they could get a bump where they weren't losing as many people at that point. But in order for that information to get in front of them, it has to travel through kind of a pipeline of data, database type thing. And I was responsible, at some point I became responsible. What I worked on the whole time was to make sure that the data that's being gathered is actually reflecting what the customers are doing. So that's what I was doing. But um, at any rate, uh, I, I really applied myself because I, I was smart enough to go, hey, this is an opportunity here. Like you got lucky, dude, right? Like, you know, I, I was like, you cannot let this job go. And so I really try to get good at it and understand it and, and, you know, be present and really like kind of apply myself. And I realized right away that that put me way ahead of everybody else. Like, cause other people were there just kind of coasting, right? It was like, it's a cubicle job. Like you don't have somebody yelling at you all the time. It wasn't a like particularly high pressure situation. It's very corporate life where you're kind of covering your yourself and, and just, you know, skating by and the incentives aren't really in place to be like an achiever. Right. And so I had to kind of figure out that whole thing too. But I just remember, you know, feeling like, you know what, I do belong here. Like I can hang here. And the the fact that I hadn't finished school didn't affect that at all. In fact, I felt like I was better at it than some of the people too. And I thought, huh, maybe this isn't, maybe the school thing isn't quite exactly how I had imagined, you know, it would be where like, you're just smarter and better when you're done it, you know, cause I just kind of had been told that again by teachers and stuff, but, um, but yeah. And then, and then I ended up being, and they hired me on as a full-time employee about a year later, which is kind of the goal. Cause when you're a contractor, they can let you go kind of any time, any, any reason. And you, you actually get a little bit more money usually, but you get far less as far as benefits go. So the net to you is actually quite a bit less. And, uh, and it's just, you know, getting a full-time employee is a lot more established of a position and, and they converted me. That's what they call it to a, to an FTE as they say in, in corporate stock, uh, corporate talk. And then I rode that wave for that long, but yeah, I mean, at some point I realized that like, it wasn't exactly fulfilling work, you know, sitting in the cubicle. Yeah. So you left this pretty safe job, right? Like I, you know, at, the, at that point you, you had become one of the people riding the wave to some degree, like you were ensconced, like you weren't yes. going to. You weren't going to get fired. You had very high job security. Yes, you know? exactly. And you left all that uh, because of LR. But that's not – it wasn't just like one day you woke up, all right, I'm going to do – I'm going to go start a podcast and quit my job. And I, I wanted to, I wanted you to kind of elaborate on that because I know a lot of people have this impression that you or other people, you know, one day decide, I've got a great idea. I'm going to quit everything and write, take that great idea and ride it to the moon. But that's – that, that is not what, what you did. T tell us kind of how that went. Yeah, no, that is definitely not what I did. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, as you said, I was a very safe job. And for me, the way I was raised, um, you don't leave a job like that. Like my family, you know, just to like set the stage, like my dad was an auto mechanic, right? That's what he did for his whole life. And my mom like took care of some kids at home. Like she had like a kind of a mini daycare, like a neighborhood daycare when I, when we were kids. And then my parents got a divorce when I was like 10. And so we went from being like, I would probably say like lower middle class, like just to sort of, you know, my mom worked retail part-time and my dad was a mechanic. Like we were, we didn't really have that much money to having like no money. Right. And, and that was when I was like 10. And so until I was 16, my mom ended up getting remarried and then we kind of restabilized, but that, that stretch, and this is like a lot of the time when you kind of become aware of things like money and that type of stuff, we were just straight up poor. I mean, like actually poor, you know, like the, you know, the one year people <clears throat> left money on, uh, on our doorstep so that my mom could buy us Christmas presents. Right. Like that's, we were at that level, right? Like that some people from the neighborhood and a, and an organization or something did. And it was like, it wasn't that much, but I mean, th th this is where we were at. Right. And so, you know, that's when, when you're raised like that, you get a job at AT&T as a full-time employee and you're making good money and like things are going well, you don't leave it. Like <laughs> 
you know, if you're raised and you've had money or you kind of understand what it's like to bounce around and kind of shoot for the stars, right? The way I like to look at it is, are you looking up or, or another way to say what, are you looking forward or are you looking back? Because if you've always had like a stable living situation and money was never really an issue for you, you're more likely to look forward. You're more likely to say, well, nothing really that bad's going to happen. So I'm going to take some risk and I'm going to go try to do something that's better than what I'm doing now, even though it might not work. But when you're raised without money, you're looking back. You're looking at, you're going, I don't want to be back there again. I don't want to be back at the grocery store. I don't want to be back taking money from people for Christmas presents. I'm not giving up this job, right? Th this is it for me. Like I made it. Right. And I'm, and I felt very grateful and lucky to do so. But I did at some point after six, seven years of doing it, have to look in the mirror and say, like, this is not, you're not happy doing this. You're just not. Right. It was really kind of soul sucking cubicle work. And I view myself as a creative person at heart. Right. I like making stuff. And I wasn't able to do that there. And so at some point, you know, we started the podcast, Ryan and I, and I've told the story a lot of times, but you know, we, we started it partially because he wanted to get a job at wizards and we thought it might give him some more visibility. And also partially because I was into podcasts very early and I wanted to make one. I just thought it would be fun. I had a computer. I had listened to a guy that still does podcasts to this day named Leo Laporte. And he kind of inspired me to say, you know what, you can do this too. And, um, and, and so, and so Ryan and I started it, but the thing that people don't realize, and this gets at what you were talking about, Luis, is that was three years before I left AT&T. That was three years of doing the podcast. And we made effectively nothing off of it that whole time. We had a sponsorship for a little while, but it was really, really like it, it didn't actually cover the cost of hosting the show. Right. So I just pay that out of my pocket for my AT&T money that whole time. It wasn't that much. It was fine, but it was like, I, we did it that long effectively for negative money. <clears throat> right. And during that time we built up our audience, right. During that time is when we connected with people and sort of were consistent and put the show out. And even though we didn't have that many listeners at first, we kept doing it. And even though it grew a bit, we were like, okay, whatever, we're just going to keep doing this. And we did it over and over for three years. And like, that's the kind of thing that sort of rolls off your back in conversation, but it doesn't when you're the one that has to show up for the podcast every day for three years. <laughs> like, right. And that is what it took to establish, excuse me, LR. And when we, so at that point I felt, I did not know, but I felt that there would be an opportunity to monetize it at least enough so that I could consider trying to do that instead of the AT&T job. And there were two mitigating factors here, or actually probably three that again, people that think that I just quit, that, that I had an idea to start a podcast and quit my job uh, and that other people do that, that they're wrong about that. That isn't how it went. First one, I knew this for a while, like for probably a year that I was like unhappy there and was starting to think about other options. So I saved up money. I saved up, um, six months of living expenses and I put that in the bank. And then, so that was one. Another one was I was playing poker at the time. Uh, while I was playing at AT&T, we'll call it semi-professionally, meaning that like I would play seriously and fairly often, but it wasn't my primary source of income, but I was definitely supplementing my income. And at that point, I was confident enough in my hourly rate at poker to be able to say, if I quit my job, I can put X amount of time into the podcast stuff and I can put the rest of my hours into poker so that I can keep myself afloat monetarily. And I also set myself a six month window where I said, okay, you saved up uh, this money for six months as like a buffer, but you're still going to be working in the sense that I still, I was going to be playing poker. I knew I'd be making less money for that six months than I had been prior, but that I would also be putting a lot of my effort into getting the podcast stuff off the ground and see if it would work. And there wasn't a good way to do it at the time. I ended up doing a Kickstarter for like a year of the show. That isn't really what Kickstarter was made for. That isn't, it didn't really fit 
but it was the only tool that we had and nobody had done this stuff in magic before. So I was like, well, here we go. And I put a lot of money and time into it. I ordered a bunch of the sleeves that we ended up doing as one of the, the giveaway things for that, uh, the rewards or whatever you want to call it. And all that, you know, th those came over from Taiwan and like I had to work with a distributor and I didn't know what I was doing. So I did a minimum order and then ended up needing more and then did another minimum order and then ended up needing more, but not that many more and had to do another minimum order. <laughs> and anybody who does any type of like inventory management is just like face palming right now. <laughs> Cause like oh, yeah. I paid the absolute maximum and ended up with more product than I needed. It was really just, you know, my lack of experience, but, um, uh, you know, but whatever. And then managing all the stuff with getting stuff sent out and, and working with, okay, are, are these coming in? Are they late? Did we, here's the prototype, you know, sign off on that. What do you want these to look like? What are the materials? How much do you want to pay? All of that kind of stuff. And I front loaded most of that and then did the Kickstarter. And I had a really good day when the Kickstarter went because it got funded within the day. And it was like, oh, there actually is an audience here that's willing to support this podcast. And I was so relieved and happy because it's funny, we didn't really have this term at the time, but I bet on myself, right, is a way to look at it. And at that point, I knew that my hunches were correct, like that, that this was something that we could explore. This is a space that we could get enough money together to justify doing it. The last uh, factor, I mentioned the saving the money and the, the other thing was that coverage had started by then. I had started doing coverage and they were expanding it pretty rapidly. But at the time, I was using my vacation hours at AT&T to to uh, go do coverage. So I was flying to like Barcelona and like Atlanta and stuff on the weekends and taking Friday or Monday or sometimes more of that off. And when I quit, I went up to my boss at Wizards, Greg, and he was running coverage. And I said, uh, I just said, Hey, Greg, um, just to let you know, I am no longer, I don't have a full-time job anymore. I quit. And uh, so you can use me as much as you'd like. And he said, good to know. And then he did. <laughs> yeah. And so then I started picking up more gigs there. And now over the course of the next couple of years, I could start to see um, the combination of poker to fill up the hours at home when I was and the, and the, the monetary part um, for anything I wasn't doing. And then the podcast with the Kickstarter. And then the next year um, after that year of podcast that had kind of been paid for would be the, the Patreon, which we're still on. Um, and then, and then coverage could sort of make up the, what, what I had made it at AT&T, um, before, and then, um, I could, you know, start to get like a more solid base because my goal leaving AT&T was to be able to make at least as much as I made there, but I was really hard on myself. It wasn't just about a bottom line number. It was about having the same things that I had, meaning have insurance put the same effective, the same amount of money into a retirement fund. And, you know, they did some matching and stuff like that too. So this, you have to pay more taxes when you're self-employed, you, nobody pays for your insurance and nobody matches your 401k. So I, I actually set a fairly high goal for myself. Like if you go get a job at like AT&T, they'll say, here's your salary and here's your benefits package, right? And let's say the salary is $70,000. The benefits package might be worth 25k to you a year. Like, Th those actually carry a huge amount of, of monetary benefit. It's just not like actual cash that goes into your account. So I needed to make up for that gap too. At least that's where I held myself. And I felt like with those three things going, I could do that. Yeah. And, and I, I know that, uh, coverage kind of ended up kind of happening. You were right place, right time. You were at a, I think it was GP Austin or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, BDM asked you to, to 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 tag in for a little while. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then coverage has kind of led to a lot of opportunities as well. Where do you see coverage going forward? Your role in coverage, at least, because now that OP was like canceled, it's kind of back now. But it's kind of unclear what those opportunities look like. Yeah, it's greatly minimized. You know, I <clears throat> I got a phone call from Wizards last year, uh, 2021, and uh, they were really straightforward, which I really appreciated. You know, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, I'm a contractor, right? All of us that do coverage are contractors for wizards, meaning that when there's an event, they send me a contract that says you will do these things for this amount for this event. I sign it and I do that. That's all they owe me is any money or whatever they've promised me for doing that event. The, I am not an employee. The, they don't they could, they could wake up tomorrow and be like, we're never using you on coverage again. And they have every right 
to do that. There's no implicit anything about that. So when, and when you're an outside contractor like that, it can be difficult to get information to those people. There's some stuff that you can't say to them because they're not, um, you know, in the building and not privy to certain stuff. And I was really grateful, um, that they reached out in the way they did. I was not happy about the messaging. The messaging was basically like, you know, there's not going to be very many opportunities, um, coming up. And then we got the big announcement, um, from, you know, Huey and company and it's similar. Um, you know, there was during the peak of my coverage career, I was doing something like 18 to 22 shows a year. So that's like half, roughly half of the weekends I was gone somewhere doing coverage. And now assuming that I'm picked for each of those, I will do four for the season. There's a potential, um, for three more, um, for us, if like DreamHack does coverage and if things worked out there, but that's kind of the peak between four and seven is kind of the the upside. That's what, that's what we're looking at. So coverage for me has changed a lot um, in that it used to be a huge, you know, kind of a pillar of my career or whatever. And now it's, I still have all the training and, and expertise that I've put into it, but I don't get to flex that muscle very often. It's just not a big work opportunity. And so, you know, I've had to, to kind of readjust the way that I think about that stuff as a result, because it's just, it is just smaller that there's just not that much of it to go around now. Well, speaking of adjustment, let's, let's talk about watches. Mm. Uh, th- this is something that has kind of stepped up to fill the void and then some, and this is of course, your YouTube channel, Wristwatch Revival. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you, you You really hate self-promotion. Don't worry. I'm here to pick up the slack. I, pay, uh, I appreciate it. I am so bad at it. Yeah. But uh, if, you, if you don't know, if you're first learning this, Mar- Marshall has an extremely successful YouTube channel where he repairs wristwatches. That's what Wristwatch Revival is. WR, you know, to, to go along with LR mm-hmm. and CR. Uh, and uh, th- this number, uh, the this channel has kind of been an overnight success, uh, as it were where it's really blown up. Like you're getting over a million views on some of your videos. And yeah. uh, when I say overnight success, it's a little tongue in cheek because exactly like LR, like you've been plugging away at this thing for a couple of years before it really ramped up. But kind of walk us through what, what is wristwatch revival? How did it start? And where do you see it going? Yeah. I, you know, I, I've been into watches for a while <clears throat> since maybe like 2013 or so. Um, I don't know that, you know, I guess I'm a watch collector, but, I don't really view myself that way. I like to, I like to own the watches and wear them, but I don't wear the, I don't have watches that are just like sit in a box and I go, look, I own this and then put it away. Like I like to actually use and wear the ones that I have. So I don't know where that puts me on that spectrum. Um, but whatever it is, I I would still say you're a watch collector. I, I kind of feel the same way about magic cards. I have some old, Magic cards that you could put in a graded slab and never do anything besides show them. They're sleeved in a deck right now that I, you yeah. know, who knows when I'll play it next, but I like to have the option to. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you and I are really, really similar in how we approach that stuff. But yeah, I mean, shorthand, I'm a watch collector and I have been since 2013 or so. And um, and and at one point, I found a, a, a channel on YouTube called the Watch Repair Channel. This guy named Mark runs it. And he... And I started watching his videos and I was just fascinated by them because I always kind of wondered what it was like inside of one of the watches that I owned. And I didn't really have an understanding of the mechanics or the fundamentals of it. And he uh, is an English guy who um, was was slash is a watch repairer um, by trade. And he decided to start doing some kind of like, almost like tutorial stuff, like teaching you how to do certain parts of watch repair. And sometimes he would also just show you how he would take one apart and put it back together. And I kind of got fascinated by it. And I used to be really into cars. Like there was a large part of my life um, that cars were kind of my main hobby. I had a car that I did a ton of work on. Um, I lived with my dad for a while in my early 20s. I rented, he had like a basement apartment thing and I rented that from him. And as I said, he was a mechanic and always had people coming over and he had a shop, like a a garage that it, with all of his tools and stuff in it. And at some point, you know, I got interested in cars and started asking him questions about it. And we really 
bonded over this. Cause when I was a kid, I, I didn't really care as much, but then when I got a car and wanted to kind of work on it was when him and I started working on it together and we would work on every weekend, we'd be out wrenching on something and it became a big part of my life. But then like my dad passed away and like, I live in the city now in an apartment where I don't have room for all that stuff. I don't have an extra car and all that. And I became more of like working on computers type guy, right? Like I'm making videos and podcasts and, and so that did that, but I did realize, man, I really like getting my hands on something, right? There is a different visceral feel about working with your hands. And I thought, you know, what if I could get good enough so that I could buy some of the watches that I want that I can't afford on eBay that are broken so I could actually buy them and then I could fix them. I could get the expertise together to, to repair them myself. And so I decided I'm going to, and then my also thought process was this might scratch that itch that I have about working with my hands because cars and watches have a lot of similarities. Um, when you break it down, it's kind of interesting, except for I could fit all my tools in a box you know, that I could put in a drawer rather than uh, have to have a whole garage full of stuff. Well, I've, I've been to your apartment. They're not all in a box. In a no, in fact, they're probably like on the ground behind me here. But, um, but yeah, and it's it's grown a little. Uh, but at any rate, um, so I I decided to do that, and then similar uh, around that time, this this Mark guy from the Watch Repair Channel also came out with a course of online things that he had put together, and so I I took his course, and um, and I started my journey down watch repair. And I had no intention of making content out of it. I, that wasn't what I was doing it for, but I trapped myself. I really, I really did it to myself. Uh, they, he recommends and, and they recommend on the courses since everybody has access to a camera of some sort now, it seems right. Like most phones, basically all phones have a camera on it, or you can get like an old cheap used digital camera for super cheap or whatever. You can get access to a cheap camera if you don't already have one. So they always recommend that you should take photographs of each step that you do as you go, because when it comes to putting the watch back together, it's a lot harder than taking it apart. And you might have forgotten what goes where, and you will have a reference photograph. And I'm like, well, screw that. I got this sweet video camera. You know, I got this, all this stuff I use for doing the broadcast for, for magic and stuff like that. So I pointed a camera at the thing. And I took apart my first watch and I opened up the video and I was like, this is kind of cool actually. Like you can really see like, I, cause I have a pretty good camera or whatever. I had a macro lens, you know, lets you get really close. And I was like, this is actually pretty neat. And I was like, I could just, you know, I could put this in the video editor. Right. And then I was like, yeah, I could chop out the parts where nothing's really happening. And like I could, I could do, do a voiceover. voiceover. <laughs> yeah, a little voiceover wouldn't kill anybody, would it? Right. And I've got all this experience. And that's the crazy part about this is that I've got so much experience talking on the fly, right? Because of coverage where like, especially remember the majority of my coverage career was covering paper magic where like somebody cracks a fetch land and you got 30 seconds to do nothing, right? Like it's not like on arena where it's quite fast paced. And so when you're sitting in the booth, you can't just be, it can't just be dead air, right? And so you need to be able to generate relevant, interesting conversation on the fly, right? I don't have a spreadsheet of topics I want to talk about. I just have to find things interesting and talk about them with my, my booth partner. Well, I can do that by myself too, or I can pretend like I'm talking to somebody else. And I have a lot of practice with that too, because, you know, when I'm in the booth doing coverage, I always view the camera or, you know, whatever I'm talking to as a person, right? I, I don't think of that as, you know, thousands of people, right? I, I don't say you guys, right? I say you, I'm, I'm talking to a person on the other end of this uh, camera. And so I can put on that mentality and do this here too. The other skill that you need when you're in the booth is that you need to be able to take aspects of your personality and turn them up or down, right? So like, for example, I'm naturally enthusiastic about magic, but not to the level that I am in the booth normally. Like if, if it's me and Luis watching a match, I don't act exactly the same way, but I'm also not fabricating that 
that enthusiasm. I do find this stuff super interesting, super fascinating. I love talking about it, but I need to turn that up from like a four to a seven or an eight, and then sometimes a 10 if something crazy happens. And I can do that too uh, on voiceover as well because I'm just used to it. So I started doing a little bit of voiceover, but now it was done. I mean, I was like, I'm doing this, I'm gonna make a channel. And when I do something like this, I like to really put a lot of thought and effort up front to get things right rather than kind of shoving it out the door and see what happens. I, it doesn't have to be perfect. I do prioritize like making things over thinking about making things. But at the same time, I really need, to, I really am the type of person to prioritize. What do I want to call this? How do I want to approach this? What are the things that this channel's about? What, what are, what are the important things that I want to get across to people and how do I do that? And I put a lot of effort into doing that. And, and then I launched the channel. Um, and I, you can tell, by the way, I, 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 I point this out to people sometimes when they ask me about how to start making a thing, because I do believe that this is the correct way to do it. And if you watch the very first video I ever did for the channel, I actually say, welcome back to another video because I wanted it to stand alone and to be, I wanted it, even the first video to fit in with all the other videos and not do the thing that everybody does <laughs> where they go, um, hi, uh, this is my first video and I'm really glad that you decided to watch it and um, I'm gonna take apart this watch now. I'm like, no, I'm hitting the ground running. I thought about this stuff ahead of time. I know the tone I wanna hit. I know what I wanna talk about and I came in, you know, blasting. And you can see that on the first video I did. Yeah, and you know, that that paid off. I've actually watched a number of these videos. In fact, I watched them with my family when they were here for I Christmas. I love it. It makes me like, so I happy. I into it, you know? Yeah, that's, <laughs> like, that's so cool, yeah. I, I've stumbled across these videos on Reddit. Like uh, one of the subreddits I like is Artisan Videos, which mm. just shows people who are good at what they're doing, like whether that's cutting up a tuna fish or, you know, building a table. And uh, your, some of your videos make their way onto there because people, yeah. you know, respect the quality of your work. And uh it's been really cool seeing seeing the whole thing blow up. And, you know, the, the common theme here for, for people who are interested in doing content, a lot of people are interested, right? I mean, very much. We're, we're living in the era of the side hustles, you know, where people yes. are like, you know, I could, I, I want to do this. I like being a content creator is so much more accessible than it used to be. Everyone has probably without buying anything, just about all the tools they need to put themselves out there, right? right. Like you, you, you've got your phone, you've got your computer, you know, you've got TikTokers building empires with their phone, no, yes. other, no other equipment needed. Totally. And uh, I think that the biggest thing, if anyone out there is trying to to go down that road, and I, and I can really co-sign a lot of what Marshall's saying, is don't expect to blow up overnight, you know? Don't, don't put like the cart ahead of a, the horse focus on like getting everything ready, getting it laid out, doing the thing the, making the content you want and then putting the time. Cause the difference between a successful podcast and an unsuccessful one is generally not that the successful one has a better idea. It's general or, or that they have better equipment, you know, that, that kind of stuff you build up over time. Obviously like yeah. w once you're really killing it, yeah, you look for places you can upgrade cause there's fewer of them. But th the thing that you need is to, to be consistent, to do the same thing week in, week out and to not, not not get too far ahead of yourself. I remember when um, when uh, Covert Go Blue posted about how much he makes on YouTube. It was like thirty thousand dollars a month or something. It was, yeah. Within the next week, there was ten more Magic players. Like I've got my new YouTube channel, and that's yep. great. You know, like he inspired people. He's like, hey, look, this is a, a thing you can do. How many of those people are still making YouTube videos? I think, I think so. Andrea Mangucci is. Yeah, maybe like, maybe one. Yeah, and it's because Covert Go Blue didn't go from making zero dollars to thirty thousand dollars a month in two months or six months or a year, it took years, right? But that's what it takes. That's and he put up a video every day for like 700 days in a row. Like yeah. you try that. That's hard. <laughs> right. And, and so he, and he also hit some lucky breaks and, and yeah. made good content and had good ideas and yep. all, all of those things together. You know, the, the professor is not there because randomly. And, and neither is LR neither, you know, the, the things that, that we, we've applied ourselves to and, I think that it's really important for people to know that because there's a lot of really cool opportunities here. And it's not just about success. Like a, a lot of this, you have to intrinsically like what you're doing and not have a benchmark of like, I need to have X listeners by X date. Cause I, yes. I don't think, I, I think that people can kind of tell that too. 
Like if that's what's oh, driving for sure. you, people, people can sense it out. And I think one of the things uh, that the Maestro here has done exceedingly well is these have all been passion projects of subjects that you love and you in, approach them with humility and wanting to learn more and people like taking that journey with you. So re- really grateful that you've had a chance to share all that with us besides of course sharing it every week, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> got some quick hits for you though. You're, okay. you're not off the hook yet. Okay. The, Mr. Clunky Maestro. What's your favorite food? Popcorn. What's your second favorite food? Uh, fried chicken. And your third favorite food. Uh, can I do a drink? Yeah, sure. Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. There we go. Uh, you know, you eat a bucket of fried chicken with an Arnold Palmer and finish it off with some popcorn. You've got, you've got Friday night right there. I don't do that very often, but I, if, if I could be more broad, it would be Asian food of basically any type would be my favorite food, but I didn't want to pick one. Right. Yeah. All right. What's your favorite non-magic or watch related hobby? Oh, basketball. For sure. And I've recently taken up tennis too, and I've been enjoying that a lot, but it's hundred basketball is it's in my blood. Well, I know you watch a ton of basketball as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you could have one basketball team move to Seattle to, to make up for the, the, the vicious betrayal, uh, what, which team would it be? It would be tempting to take the thunder back because that was the team that was stolen, but they're, they're tainted now. (laughs) Yeah. And and we change them back. And so I don't want them. They can keep them now. It would be the nets, the Brooklyn nets. And here's why when, when the Sonics left or were brutally ripped from our city's heart, we had the year prior drafted Kevin Durant, who has gone on to become, you know, maybe a top 15 all time player in the NBA, like an incredible player. And so we were on the upswing having just gotten Durant. Well, he plays for the Nets now. <laughs> so if we can steal him and get him for at least his last few years of his career, justice. I'm, I'm in for it. Plus, I root for the Nets. So, yeah. All right. So leading back to magic, what was the most memorable play you've seen from the booth or memorable moment? Oh, wow. Um, a few of them come to mind. Um, one of my favorite moments was when Christian Calcano got his top eight. Um, that was a huge one. Um, a lot of, a lot of moments with you, um, were, were really big. The settle the wreckage play stands out to me as one that was, very standout. I think if I have to pick one moment that like I'll never forget type thing is when me and Paul covered, um, I think it was Yam Wing Chun versus uh, oh, Paulo Vitor oh, The punt and, around the world. Yeah, it was emotional. You know, yeah. it, it was like this incredible. And, and Paul, particularly Paul, was all over that call and I, and I was right there with him and, and we, you know, we did an extremely dramatic moment justice. And, and I'll never forget that one. It felt really good to, to, right. to do our job. It didn't feel good for him, but no, but he's part yeah. of the legend and tapestry of magic. More people yeah. know who he is because of that. And I, I really like him by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's a huge, great. huge, huge hoops fan too. Uh, who's your favorite player to watch on coverage? You. Okay. That was a little self-serving. Easily, that was yes, <laughs> it is though. I, but you know, it's a combination of my personal investment in you. Also your high level of skill and your speed of play. Like you are the most fun to watch from both a speed and skill, but also like you always do something funny and, and it, you make it more interesting. So yeah, you're, you're the goat to get in the, in the I future match that. area for right. sure. Let's close things out. If you could change one thing about magic, what would it be? Oh man. <laughs> I just had like three answers. I probably shouldn't say, um, <laughs> rules wise, I would take the, the cap on hand size out. That's one that you brought up a while ago. And I was like, yeah, wait a minute. He's totally right. Like, why, why do we have this kind of like, let me, let me fly high. Um, I guess I'll keep it simple. I, I would, I would make, I believe that limited brings in a lot of new players and I believe that it represents a r- for most players, the highest skill level that they get to is playing booster drafts regularly. And so I would, they are going to be doing them at the pro tours, which I think was the correct decision. World championships. I would make limited, even though I understand that it doesn't perform as well in terms of viewer numbers and stuff like that, I would make it core to the, to the game. Um, I think that it's unique in that it can onboard players who don't have cards yet, yet it also represents the highest skill ceiling I think that most people get to. So I would prioritize it. I I believe that. Like, that isn't just me being a pundit for limited. I I really believe that that actually benefits the game more. 
not disappointed because that's the answer I was hoping to hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, taking time out of your uh, busy schedule, Maestro. And, by, uh, by ambushing me with the interview show. This is the fun, best though. interviews are ambush ones. I, I, yeah. yeah, you have to admit, I didn't have any too, too many hard hitting questions except maybe your favorite food. So, yeah, uh, yeah. That was a really pinned down question that I'm already yep. regretting. But yeah. <laughs> but it's supposed to be quick hits, right? You say the first yeah. thing that comes to your mind. Exactly. Right? Uh, so that'll do it for this week, of course. Uh, We'll see you next week here on Limited Resources. You can find Marshall at Marshall underscore LR or me at, at LSV. And, uh, of course, you can find every episode at LRcast.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors as well, ChannelFireball.com. You can go there for all your magic-related needs. And you know, use code LR on checkout to show the podcast a little love. And, of course, FTX for all your digital asset and cryptocurrency needs. They're a, a safe, trusted exchange. And you can download uh, their app on the iPhone store, uh, ftx.us in the US or ftx.com outside of it. And uh, that'll do it for this week. We'll see you next week. So I'm supposed to do a sign off, right? <laughs> like this is like, if you have to do the intro, I have to do the sign off. Is that how this works? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're both load bearing when it comes to the structure of the show. So uh, I have got one um, then that uh, actually... Uh, you'll have to indulge me a little bit because it is watch related, but it is open. It is very much uh, meant for people who aren't as into watches as I am. And I got sent this link probably 20 times over the past week. And there's a, a guy who made, I, I'm not using hyperbole. It's, it's probably the coolest website I've ever seen. It is wow. exactly what I thought the internet was going to be when it like first came out. <laughs> like the promise of the internet was not everybody fighting on social media, right? The promise of the internet was like um, new ways to uh, present information so that anybody could get it, right? If you had internet access, you could get access to this information as well. And you could teach yourself, learn things, expand your horizons. And when it comes to a mechanical watch, look, admittedly, this isn't, you know, the most important thing, but it is fascinating. It has been around for a long time and it's really interesting uh, for curious people to know how it works. It's very difficult to show. Um, even through my videos, I usually can only focus on one little part of the watch at a time because it just gets too unwieldy. But there's a guy who made a website where he thoroughly explains literally every portion of a modern mechanical watch, but he made... I guess there are 3D models of oh, each sick. of all of the components. Now, I know you might be thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. I can like twist it around and look at the different sides. And you would be right. That is part of what he did. But he also used physics with these so that, for example, it might show a spring and there's a slider bar. And when you pull it over, the spring cinches in. And if you let go, the slider bar slides back and it goes wong, 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 like a spring does. And then it goes back again. And like, and then you get like exploded views of all the things you can watch the watch running from any angle on an exploded view and you can hit pause and it'll stop it. You can slow it down so that you can see, okay, so this turns that releases this, this clicks over, then this happens. It is unbelievable. And like I said, I've had tons of non-watch people and tons of watch people go, you have to see this. This thing's so cool. And uh, then it was actually really neat too, because it's actually comprehensive. So it's a, quite a long um, site. You can kind of take it in over a little bit of time. But the crazy part is he gave me a shout out at the end of the article. And I didn't, I hadn't gotten to the end of it. And somebody sent it to me and was like, wow, this guy like said, he gave, like he shouted out two entities at the end. And one of them was my channel on YouTube. So I thought that was really awesome. And also a friend of mine named Royal here. It was really funny. He sent it to me like, Hey, you've probably already seen this, but look how cool this is. And then he sent me a follow-up tweet a little while later. He's like, well, crap. He actually mentioned you in the, in the actual piece. Um, but I'll put a link in the show notes. Actually, wait a minute. Don't you have to do the editing and the everything for this? No, no, no. My oh, that's <laughs> your statute of limits. Okay, I, fine. I will put the I will put the show I've written into the into the show notes just so you have it for for reference because I know that. Uh, oh, that that'll go up for the patrons. Yeah, the patrons that, get it. Yeah, um, but yeah. At any rate, um, I'll put a link um, in the show notes for that, and I, I'm not again not no hyperbole. It's the coolest website I've ever seen. What, well, what's the website? Uh, it's kind of a weird URL, oh. but I will put it in the I'll put it in the show notes so anybody watching can 
watching or listening can look in the show notes or in the description and they'll see it there.